the thing is right now that every single young man, okay, has the access to nudity, naked women, porn at an instant. And that's extremely detrimental because that creates a false image and an expectation of what marriage or, or what relationships will be like and have these qualities to be a man. Okay. But what, what does Islam teach us to be, you know, what are the qualities to be a man? Gratitude, honestly, you know, people think of it as wishy-washy, but when we look at it from a, from a religious perspective, from Islam, it's being grateful for everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. Those days where it doesn't go the way you want it to, it's how you respond to that. It's how receptive you are to that. We didn't have hot water. I didn't pay for hot water. We had a gas card, we never topped that up. And when we look at it, it stems from, it's, it's going back to how when people um, are constantly seeking happiness, constantly seeking instant gratification, it, your dopamine receptors essentially get fried. Hi guys, welcome to the CEO Club. Today I've got an amazing guest with me called Riaz. Riaz, introduce yourself, brother. Salam alaikum, my name's Riaz. Um, I appreciate you having me on, man. So tell me a bit about yourself, Riaz. What is it that you do? So me, um, currently uh, I work as a private audiologist. Um, I'm a global online coach, so I do online health and fitness coaching. And I also do videography, photography. So I've got my uh, creative page called Creative Focus and then creating content around all things health, fitness, well-being, spirituality, religion. You've got your hands in a fair few pies, Marshall. You're doing really well. I think that's why we wanted to bring you onto the CEO Club. Let's just take it back. Talk to me about your upbringing, where you're from, uh, your sort of childhood years and what got you into the things that you're going to. We're going to start right from the beginning and uh, your viewers might know this, might not know this either, but we've known each other for quite a while, isn't it? It's like on, five, five years. We first got in touch on... 2018, yeah, yeah 2017, 2018. Just like I've been following your journey since then and then, you know, we've kind of kept in contact over the years. Me, myself, born here and then... I grew up in Germany, so I spent five years in Germany and lived there for quite a few years and came back here. And literally when I came to the UK, I couldn't speak a word of English. And for f probably the first two years, I think, like, I remember being in year one and year two, I was uh, struggling to make friends. Like, wow. I couldn't speak English properly. And But you, you quickly learn, you quickly learn, obviously, because I was so young. I picked it up within after two years. So okay. when I was about seven, seven, eight, English was just rolling off my tongue and then German, I slowly started to forget it. Okay. But then after that, really just secondary school, I had to change schools. I was a little brat when I was younger, man, like um, always getting into trouble, always, you know, just causing havoc, man. And what kind of havoc? <laughs> so I used to be really cheeky okay. and I used to always get into tension. I used to, you know, swear at teachers and draw things that I shouldn't be drawing. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, too much detail there. <laughs> and uh, just honestly, when I was younger, like, I just used to get in trouble a lot in school. So I had to change secondary school, went to a different school, same thing kind of really repeated there. And, uh, you know, messing about a lot, getting into detentions, getting suspended. And because of the school I moved to, that's where all my boys were. And, you know, okay. all kind of getting together. And I wanted to be that class clown and, you know, be be, be that be that guy. And okay. evidently in them years, it hindered me. So when I got to when about probably year 10, about 14, 14 years old, roughly 13, 14 years old, few events that happened in my life, obviously a death in the family and just, it kind of made me switch a bit and okay. think, put things into perspective, focus more on religion, take a more, you know, a, a different aspect and into things. Okay. Kind of just got into it from there. And then I, I put my head down, started studying properly and no detentions. Like literally when I got into year 11, I think it was, I just started to focus a lot more you know, really focusing on studying, not making money, nothing like that. I used to work part time. I used to wa uh, wash pots and dishes, bro, in a takeaway, bro. I remember um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So I used to work in River Island, Tuesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then Friday, Saturdays, I used to work in a takeaway. So as soon as I finished from River Island on Friday, Saturday, I'd wait in front of a corner shop and the guy would pick me up and I'd have my curry stained shoes on from the week before oh, yeah. <laughs> and going, cutting onions, bro, washing pots, pans, everything. Bro. I did that for literally until I was 17, okay. until, until I got a car. And then I started doing delivery driving and stuff like that. So after I finished secondary school, Alhamdulillah, my results were good. I put my head down, school recognized it, got into college. 
from their college again the, the focus was never really that, that entrepreneurial focus it was just kind of the gym religion working and I was in that mindset I need to work I need to work I need to um, earn money I need to kind of make th- make this you know living for myself obviously coming from a family where you my dad he made it seem like we had everything from yeah. a very young age and I think that was pivotal in my journey because from a very young age, even though we didn't really have much, my dad always worked, uh, you know, manual labor jobs, factory jobs, working in restaurants. Um, he, he was never that businessman, anything like that. And But he had the work ethic and he, he grafted. So seeing that from a young age, he instilled that in me naturally. I was like, I want to be like my dad in that sense that that work ethic and that grind is just, just it's like in our DNA, bro. Yeah, and. Course. Taking it from there, really, I I thought, okay, I, I as I got older, I realized that we don't have what I, what I thought we did, and you know the resources are scarce. So I thought, at what age did you did you realize that? Um, when I was about 11, 12, because that's when I started. I used to sell in school, so I used to get Lucas Aids, Kit Kats, Vimto's, everything. Vimto's <laughs> in my blazer pocket, everything. Yeah. And my dad didn't used to let me sell them, so my dad never wanted me to work. Uh, when I was in school and that's interesting so when, when I used to sell sweets and stuff like that honestly bro like he'd take them take them off me if he saw him if he saw Lucas in the fridge he'd take him and he took him in the bin or he put him in his safe like he, he didn't want me to do that so it was very so what I would do is because my dad would work at 6am in the morning so he'd go to the factory so I'd wake up just after him after he's left for work I'd go to Iceland um, <laughs> I, I'd, I'd, yeah. I'd pack my bags I'd get um, I used to save my dinner money up so I didn't used to spend my dinner money I used to save it up for two weeks and then that was like my initial investment so you had okay. £2 a day had about 20 quid saved up Blue Crusade then pack of 8 was about £3 wow, yeah. used to buy that Chew It's pack of 7 pack of 6 £1 Toffee Crisp £1 Harry Bowls everything I used to stash it in my bag go to school sell it and I'd be sold out before he'd come back from work so I'd keep all my stock on me and mm-hmm. not at home so it was the same same principle applied really when I used to go uh, work in the takeaways work in the restaurants 13, 14, 15 at a very fragile age my dad didn't want me to be in that environment because being in that environment uh, with you know a, a lot of the elder guys that smoke swearing and just speaking about things that my dad wouldn't want me to be there around yeah I just wanted to earn money so he'd lock the doors when I used to come home from I used to ring my sister to open the door and then he'd quickly come with a sandal and try, <laughs> to try me. so so what do you think was the reason that he didn't want you to work was it just sort of protecting you or I think he thought that I would be easily influenced astray and then I'd want to work in a takeaway or a restaurant you know for the majority of my life not that there's anything wrong with that but what he tried to instill from a very young age is study, 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 study. And then yeah. to have your son then go wayward and go to a completely different direction. It's not what he wanted. And he, he wasn't like the typical, you know, Asian father that we see. He's not, he didn't just used to go to work and then that's it, demand food or demand things. My dad cooks, cleans, um, he used to drop me off to school and do all, do pretty much everything that a mother would do. My dad does oh. and he still does that for my younger brothers. And I think a lot of, I don't say it enough yeah. and I don't have that, that relationship with my father um, since we really talk. Again, I think it's a typical Asian, you know, immigrant father and son kind of relationship. We don't really talk yeah. just when it's necessary. <laughs> necessary. Yeah. We just, you know, do, what, do what's necessary. But he just didn't want me to be led astray. And okay. he felt that as a, at a young age, you know, your mind is like a sponge. You're going to be influenced by many things. And I was. But as a kid, you're always you know how to get away with things. That's interesting, Marshall. That's really inspiring. With your dad not wanting you to get into work and for him to be cooking and cleaning and not being your typical Asian dad, do you feel like that influences your social media content? Because I see where you're different compared to a lot of other guys and I see it and, I, and I'm sort of complimenting you here is you're posting a day in the life, you're cooking, you're cleaning, you're praying, you're doing a lot of things that most young Asian males don't tend to do. So I feel like you're positively guiding our Asian community and Asian uh, males in sort of what masculinity is. What's your thoughts on that? What do you say? I think subconsciously, probably yes, over time growing up, you basically become the individual where you're surrounded, you know, with what you're surrounded with. And I was surrounded with, you know, Alhamdulillah, and I'm grateful for it, a father who was present in in a lot of aspects of my life. And the same with my mum as well. Again, we didn't really have much, but I think it's just the values that they instilled in me. And I was really disrespectful when I was young to my dad. And I, re- I only just realised it when I get older. Yeah. But going back to what you said, yes, because I think because I've seen what 
a bad father is and I've seen what a great father is and I've seen it from, from other people as well. Yeah. And I've, I've, a lot of my close friends, they don't have their fathers in their lives anymore, passed away or they're just not in their life anymore. And I think for me seeing that and having a, a huge role to play in the upbringing of my little brothers. And because when I, when I was about 11, 12, when they were born, so I used to, you know, the nappy changing, the feeding, everything, just helping out with, with what I could. Yeah. Again, that was a, a combination of how I remember what my dad used to do and just being there exposed to it and wanting to do it all the time. So it's, that's what masculinity is really, to be honest, you know, okay. I, th I think, in Western society and in the culture now, what's often propagated is that masculinity is to be really assertive, be really disciplined and be demanding in a sense and have these qualities to be a man. Okay. But what, what does Islam teach us to be, you know, what are the qualities to be a man? Somebody who's humble, somebody who with at home, he helps his wife, he helps his family, he's kind to his family and he instills values in others which come from Islam. And what does that teach us? It teaches to be somebody who's kind, somebody who's soft-hearted. And I think over the years, just really a combination of religion, a combination of the content that I consume, a combination of the people that I stay with, family, has really shaped the individual that I'm trying to be and the individual who I currently am. So what do you think it is about this generation whilst we're talking about this topic? Why is there so much conflict? Why, are, When you look at the content out there now, the reason we've got you on is you're providing positive content, valuable content that people can learn from. Mm. Why is there so much degenerate content out there where you know males are fighting with females, females are fighting with males, you've got people just bashing each other and not really appreciating the value that you know you bring each other. What do you think is causing that in this generation at the moment in time? Is it just goes back to what we seek. It goes back to what we seek as as individuals as and as a society and it's instant gratification. And and that's that's one of the one of the big factors of it. Because everybody wants content instantly. Everybody wants something where they'll get their attention like that. You know, if your content doesn't have a hook that within two to three seconds it grabs someone's attention, then A, it's not gonna really reach that many people and B, people are really not, not really not interested in it. I think a lot of times now people are confused with their identity. People are confused of who they should be following, who they should be taking guidance from and who they should be taking value from. And what happens is they, they take so much, so much education, you want to call it from these individuals who claim to be something because they have a big following or they're popular or they get involved in controversy. And what that does is it influences young people and it influences young people in a way where say for example rappers and music and, and grime and a lot of the music videos and a lot of the lyrics that are about today what is about it's about money it's about sex it's about drugs it's about violence and what i've seen now um say for example for my younger brother's friends like they're 10 and 11 and you know i'm very careful with what they consume and kind of monitoring it but what you see within those young children uh, the tiktok generation okay <laughs> because luckily we're not in that generation and i know mm. there's a few years apart from me and you but yeah. we didn't grow up being exposed to uh tiktok to um, even Instagram to, to an extent because TikTok came about when I was probably what 20, I think, in the last three to it's four been years. Recent, yeah, it's not so been long at all. We didn't grow up with that, we grew up with a different set of values somewhere else where we take our guidance from, somewhere else where we take our, our content from. But now, what happens is because it's so instant now, people the dopamine receptors are fried because it's just everything is instant, everything is constant validation constant happiness and momentary happiness and when people seek that they they very rarely go outside their comfort zone they very rarely do something which is outside of the ordinary because they want something like that they want something which is instant now when it's instant it's also detrimental because you seek more of it and when you seek more of it you're never going to have enough that's why tiktok instagram has an infinity scroll facebook has infinity scroll because you can keep on keep on scrolling and Next thing you know, it's been an hour and you've done nothing. And then the guilt you feel for that holds you back even more because you're like, damn, what did I do? That's and then you do sense. another 10 minutes of work or something like that. And then it holds you back even more. But that's that's the whole focal point of what all of this 
content constitutes around. It's about getting people's attention, being instant with something. And how long can you hold that person's attention for? Because at the end of the day, it reaches the young people more. The The main demographic for TikTok is what, 12 to 18 year olds. Yeah. I'll probably ask the video guys to tag something that's just uh, come up on my Instagram. A, a group of women just barking like dogs and they were like oh we've got like some sort of dog uh i think dog identity or something and it was just bizarre but like, why is this like why is instagram recommending this to me like what have i done and it was just coming up and they're like they're just woofing at the camera and people will be able to watch the video if i can post it without any copyright hmm. and they're just woofing saying you know refer to us as dogs and Do you get what i mean and it's, it's confusion like, bro it's like what is going on it's a confusion because when you because at the end of the day we're all slaves to something, whether we, whether we like it or not, we are all slaves to something. People who are not slaves to their religion, are slaves to music, to, uh, are slaves to um, rappers, singers, uh, the slaves to actors or their idols, okay? Now, what you're a slave to is completely dependent on your values. Like, we can gladly say as Muslims that we are slaves to our religion. You know, Allah refers to as, you know, um, when he when he talks about his servants Abdullah servants of Allah that's what we are and we can we, we can with contentment in our heart say that we are slaves of our religion because being a slave to your religion what does that instill in us as Muslims it instills values it instills mannerisms it instills charity fasting salah contentment not seeking constant you know instant gratification looking at the stories of the sahabas looking at the stories of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his his family and the extended family if we can be a slave to that then happy days man we're taking good from that but everyone is a slave to something and unfortunately what a lot of people have become slaves to is a lot of the content they consume on social media a lot of the negative content that they consume and what would you say for people that are living this generation where they want to, you know, push content out there, but they're not getting the views or the likes uh, because of how easy, like you said, if you post something that's controversial, like we're sat here now and we just say like a really crazy controversial statement, which we want because uh, we're professionals here <laughs> and uh, we can't. Uh, but if we did, then instantly people would just be hooked and they, you know, they're yeah. following it and they're liking it and, and people are hooked onto, you know, if we act like idiots now, yeah. it's going to get so much views, you know, exactly. just because where where people are acting like idiots and I've seen people having mental breakdowns and you know on TikTok for example or you'll see videos that pop up and it's girls just going crazy and yeah. people are viewing that and it's coming you know onto the homepage don't know what you call it the news feed yeah. or whatever it is uh, and it's going viral when you've got so much controversies and crazy content out there that people are consuming how do you make your content stand out from the rest? Be authentic be authentic be just to a crazy amount, just authenticity, because people can smell it when you're not authentic. And do you know what it is right now? I think the content we consume and to, to post content, everybody wants to do. I do it myself, bro. Like I do it myself. Like I want, when, I, when I'm posting something, when I, when I plan my content, I'm thinking, right, is this gonna go viral? You know, how, how many people am I gonna reach with this? You know, I write down different titles that I can use, um, how, how I can really articulate it. And, and then I think to myself, like, wow, I've put so much thought into what I'm going to be posting. Now, I've been posting now for five and a half, six years. Yeah. Okay. It took me four years, four and a half, five years to get to 15K. Okay. Now, my first 10K followers took me about two or three years. After that, to get to 15K took me like another year. After that, to get to 18K, it took me like another year. You know, this was before reels or everything else. And it was difficult, man. It was difficult. I was just posting content. I, I kept on posting content, bro. And you'll, you'll see, you know, like the hours. I've put over 1,500 hours into my Instagram, into just pr wow. producing content, bro. And I've learned, invested money, invested a heck of a lot of time into just posting content and posting and creating content as well. And for me, it was, I enjoyed doing it. Okay, I just wanted to post content. I just wanted to create content. And I learned a heck of a lot. That's why every single business that I'm in now, everything, every project which has come about now, anything that I make money from now goes back to the beginning. I just enjoyed it. I played the long game, which probably a lot of people don't have the patience to do. You know, I didn't yeah. make any money from anything that I did for about four or five years. I just carried on doing it. Wow. I, enjoy, I enjoyed it. People might say it's insane because I was doing the same thing, expecting a different result, but I was trying to learn and adapt as I went along. Yeah. So what you see people now is, and kind of just linking to what I was saying as well, when I then, when my followers start to increase more was literally when I, I think 
my followers, my page, my business started to grow when I stopped using music in 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 my um, on any of my Instagram. Not that I used to. I used to use instrumentals and I used to use beats, right? And just before Ramadan, when I moved to Surrey, when I lived there for about nine months, I was working as a locum there. I thought, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch up my content. I'm just gonna do something which I I enjoy doing or something which is a bit more natural to me. Just recording myself. I've been recording myself for years. Just anything. And then I started posting that out. And then that Ramadan, last April, from April to now, so we, we page is slowed down right now, but from April to like November, December, so that, that five, six months, my page went from like 16K to 107K. MashaAllah, that's amazing. So you're on six figures. Yeah, and Alhamdulillah, with that, the business grew as well. With that, um, it instilled a lot more creativity in me and it allowed me to be a lot more genuine as well. The point I'm making is that you have to be patient with anything. You know, I don't look at the followers as a metric of just as a vanity metric. It is that I check my followers a lot of the time and I check how many views I've got. Of course I do that. It's, it's, it's a vanity metric, which quite often we can use when we work with brands. And it quite it's quite often a measure of someone's success, which can also be detrimental. But if you peel back the layers and look at why are you doing this, you know, I've posted almost 800 different pieces of content within them, different carousels, diff within different pages. You could say over 1,500 pieces of content, combine that then with the plus 1,500 hours, you're looking at about over 2,000 hours of me on my laptop, on my phone, creating content. If you don't have the patience to do that, then don't do it. Don't post content. If you don't have the patience to do it in the long game, don't do it because a business isn't going to come out of it. Your page isn't going to grow. You're not going to be authentic with it. And you're going to be doing what everybody else is doing, trying to just jump on a trend, trying to create content just for the sake of it and not for value. You've got to provide value. Uh, where we can sort of go from here is if you just let the viewers know some of the things and businesses that you're involved in and, and what kind of uh, things you're actually doing at the moment, just to sort of break it down. Of course, of course. So currently I'm a private audiologist and that's my full-time role. Um, so I studied audiology at the University of Leeds, qualified 2021. And then mm. I, then <laughs> funny actually, um, I didn't want to be an audiologist, right? And yeah. I, my coaching business, I started that about two and a bit years ago. And so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of stick with the timeline. So qualified as a PT when I was 19, didn't do any work in the gym because I was studying, I was on placement, I was working part-time, I was working in Carphone Warehouse. I used to travel back from Manchester to Leeds, work, do deliveries, do Carphone Warehouse. Didn't have the time to be a PT. Created a fitness ebook. book uh, took me about six months. So I had about 10,000 followers then, 2019 I released it, April 2019. Then, um, in total, I probably made about seven hundred pounds from that, and that was for me, bro. Wallahi, bro, I felt I felt like a millionaire. <laughs> I kid you not, bro. Because when when I'm thinking like on top of, because probably from my work and from like working, and I probably used to make about eight hundred a month, and then from uh, the um, the ebooks, probably like an extra seventy pound a month, hundred pound a month. Okay. So I was in uni and I was traveling and like making just almost a grand a month for me, bro. That was. Top dollar for me, top dollar yeah. for me. And I was yeah, like, you could do a lot back then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. I was thinking, wow, that's amazing. So I did the ebooks and then I realized, how can I scale this? So I spent eight months trying to build a website in my second year of uni, just wasn't working. And in between that time, um, that's when we worked as well, uh, you know, yeah. with the recruitment. This was 2019 summer. That's when I decided I don't want to be an audiologist, <clears throat> but I'm going to do it for the sake of it anyway, just get my degree okay. because I changed from, I wanted to be a sports doctor, changed from that within doing one year of sports science, didn't really enjoy it. So I thought, okay, I'm in the degree now. I'm going into second year. I'm, I'll try to build whatever business I can. I'll do it. Amazon failed. Uh, trading failed. Um, Dropshipping didn't go the way I wanted it to. Um, social media marketing didn't go the way I wanted it to. And uh, affiliate marketing didn't go the way I wanted it to. I was just burning through cash right now. I'm thinking, okay. damn, I'm, what am I doing? And then I thought, okay, what's under my nose right here? The fitness, the coaching. Okay, let me utilize this. Let me leverage this. So did the eBooks, couldn't scale it, spent ages building a website, couldn't do it. Got into my third year of uni, then got in touch with a, got in touch with a company, built me the infrastructure, um, built me the business around it. We spoke a lot. And so that where Coach by Rias comes from. So that's okay. what happened in my third year of uni. Okay. Right. Um, third year of uni? No, second year of uni, I think. I can't remember. Second or third year of uni. Um, it must have been in the autumn time. And then COVID came. And then 
long story short, creative focus came from that. So creative focus is the videography and the photography side of things. So within that one year, two businesses came and I didn't really expect it. Um, I really wanted the coaching, but I just didn't know how to articulate it, articulate the content in a way which would be valuable um, to viewers where they would buy into me because I've given, 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 given. Now it's my time to ask. And if you look at any, um, any successful person, you have to give in abundance first and then you can ask because you have that trust and you have that reputation, then you can ask. So I thought, okay, I'll probably build some trust. So again, Creative focus came, <clears throat> videography, photography, doing it for businesses, doing weddings, here, there, and that. Once I qualified as an audiologist, I graduated, I was like, damn, that's it, done. I don't want to be an audiologist. Um, I then went on to be an area manager for Aldi, because uh, that's what I wanted to do, to do for about two years. They pay really well, think. though. They yeah, pay. so Alhamdulillah, um, it was, you know, if, if I would have stayed for another two years, probably in about two years, it would have probably been six figures now. And that's what I was searching, just a six figure salary all six the time. Six figures, they yeah. pay area managers. And they, and they give you a company car and, wow. you know, everything's pretty much everything's paid for. Really. Is it really stressful though? The thing is, if it's the only thing you do, you're going to excel in it. You can ex If you can give it your heart and soul, it, it's, you're going to excel in it. Okay. Before I left, they said to me, you have to be willing to give, you have to be willing to sell your soul for this job. I wasn't willing to do that. I built every. I spent so many years trying to build an infrastructure for myself where I can provide more value and essentially make money on my own terms. So, uh, just before twenty twenty two, I left that role. I, I was there for about four months. I was miserable. I just didn't like it. I thought it was. It's, I thought it's what I wanted. What made was, you miserable about that role? I wasn't training. I lost weight. Um, the shift patterns were weird. Like some days I'd be up at four o'clock to, to open up a store at five because you have a training period for quite a while. Okay. Just within that year, you cover kind of different stores, you do different things, different tasks. And I thought, damn, this ain't for me. Like I've got the car, I've got what I wanted and I'm still not happy. And I think what, I was 21, they paid you 44K starting salary. Yeah. After, after, after you qualify and you know, it's, 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 a, it's a decent salary. It's 44,000 pound a year. Yeah. And oh. I thought, okay, that's, you know, that's all right. So I, I, then I left that after four months and I was like, damn, what am I going to do now? Like, I, pro I probably had like 10 clients at the time doing videography here and there. And I was like, I'm going to go back into audiology. I thought, don't want to work in the NHS. No disrespect to the NHS, but they just don't have the facilities to pay well. So I worked as a locum in so the NHS. What does an audiologist <clears throat> do though? So I treat hearing loss. Um, okay. Currently my specialty now, I'm specializing more in tinnitus, which is kind of um, essential. <laughs> the way I say it to patients is the perception of an internal sound when there's a lack of an external sound. Okay. It's a ringing and buzzing sound. And um, I did some work in pediatrics as well. Again, one thing that I enjoyed, but because I left um, and I work in the private sector now, there's not much variety in the kind of patients I see. So mainly it's prescription of hearing aids, treating hearing loss, rehabilitation of tinnitus. Um, that's one, one area that I'm kind of uh, more passionate about. And again, tinnitus rehab, um, working on cognitive uh, cognitive behavioral therapy as well, which I then implement with my um, clients as well. So it works kind of hand in hand. So currently, private audiologist, um, I do some locum work on, on the weekends as well. Um, some just remote consultations. I do the coaching full time and I have a few creative fortune creative focus projects which I'm editing at the moment and I'm going to be taking on a few more projects at the moment now so if you were to look at it the businesses that I'm involved in what I'm involved in it's all in being of in service of people and that that's why I feel my you know quote unquote calling is you know every single person is on this earth for a limited amount of time with a limited amount of resources and a limited amount of reach now what you do with that is entirely dependent on you and the the way you again convey yourself and what you provide again it's entirely up to you for me it's treating patients you know i love it i love connecting with patients i love helping them working with people all over the world coaching them helping them you know women men of all shapes and sizes working with them i love it again working with creative focus and um photography and videography providing brides and grooms uh, uh, telling them a story for them for their wedding days for businesses again being able to convey a story convey a message being that bridge between them and the audience being in service of people and i found that the the moment i realized that for me to excel is to be in constant service of people the moment i grasped that money started coming
What would your advice be to people uh, who are probably listening to this and uh, maybe are at the stage where you were at, where you were trialing out all these different business ventures and opportunities and losing money, failing? There's a lot of people uh, in this day and age that feel like they're stuck in a situation where they don't know what to do. They're just going from one thing to another, failing. It's not really materializing into anything. What would you say to somebody who's in that situation now listening that you would say now you're in the position that you're in, that you would probably say to yourself when mm. you're in that position? Yeah, Alhamdulillah, you know, <clears throat> again, I thank Allah for absolutely everything. Like without Allah, I am nothing. Everything that I have now and everything that, that I'm building towards now, Wallahi, I would never have imagined this in my wildest dreams. And I, I never would have thought it, do you know what I mean? And without getting into the material aspect of things, um, the, the position I feel that God has put me in and the, I think the opportunities he's given me is I'm, 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 for, I'm forever grateful for that. So that's first and foremost. And I think that's one of the major aspects. If anybody is confused, if you're confused, if you don't know what you're doing and there is just no direction, try out as many things as you can. Because a lot of my viewers, quite often, they are young, probably similar age as me, a bit younger. Quite a, a lot of my clients are older than me, quite a lot older than me, double my age. But I think just as a general, try out as many things as you can. What's the worst that could happen? It's not going to work. You try something else. What's the worst that could happen? It's not going to work. You know, when we, when I look at it into the perspective of things, I didn't actually burn through that much money. You know, Alhamdulillah, I was living with my parents and, you know, and it, it was, there wasn't that much of a risk. And although, you know, you try and do as much as you can for your family and, you know, paying the bills, the mortgage and everything like that. At the end of the day, if, if you lost quite a lot of what you have, you still wouldn't be homeless. That's that, that's the reality of it. People are not scared to do things because they're going to be homeless or they're not going to have shelter. They're just scared of quite often what people think. They're scared of failing and they're scared of it just not going the way they want. And that's the reality. It's not going to go the way you want. And you know yourself, bro. You've been in business for a long time, bro. Twice mm. the time I've been. Do you know what I mean? Oh. And you know, <laughs> yeah, you, know you, <laughs> hey. you know yourself, bro. Oh, like you course. came out of uni, and and they they essentially saw you, and they were like, you know what? This guy's got potential. This guy's doing well. And absolutely. When you studied accounting, was it business? Accounting? That was a business management. Bus yeah, business yeah, management, of course. And surely, when you once you graduated, you must have been like on a bit of a slippery slope like what am I doing you know yeah it's, you know oh. what direction do I go in now and that's what people fail with a lot of the time and the main thing that I will say is try different things fail and fail often fail failure is one of the best lessons you will get because two three four years down the line you realize that wasn't actually a failure that was a lesson at that time you treated it as a failure but now, when I think of it, I think of it, all of those things were lessons for me to guide me to the direction where I am now and to provide me with all of the facilities and the resources that I have now. And again, I'm just eternally grateful for that. And those are the fundamentals that people need to really consider. And so when you when you do fail now, how does that make you feel? Amazing. Okay. Wallahi, I love it. Like, I, I, I seek it. Like, I'm thinking, do you know what? Alhamdulillah, things are going right. Things are going well. You know, um... Am I only being grateful because Allah is allowing me to excel in these opportunities and things are going well? Or what will what will I be like when things when something doesn't go well? Like for a while now, my Instagram wasn't growing. I started losing followers. Uh, and it's funny. Um, it's when I started this role as a private audiologist and because uh, I'm pulled in different directions and it was difficult. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, oh, how do I, you know, is, is this a kind of business was slowing down a bit and I was getting overworked. But then it's going back to, you know, just, I'm just grateful. Gratitude, honestly. You know, people think of it as wishy-washy, but when we look at it from a, from a religious perspective, from Islam, it's being grateful for everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. Once we are grateful, Allah gives us more. Allah doesn't say that, you know, once we believe and once we testify in our religion that we, we will have everything. Allah tests us even more when, when you know, when we believe. It's, you know, it's not a matter of we say we believe and Allah won't test us. We're going to be tested in our faith, in our wealth, in our health. And as long as you can establish that no matter what you're going through, and I know that every single Muslim has probably heard of this quote, but Allah does not burden you. Allah does not burden a soul beyond what it can bear. Mm -hmm. And that for me is so profound. Any tribulation I go through, I think of that. I think if Allah has put me through this right now, if God has put me through this right now, then surely I can I can surpass this. 
And that has been a fundamental in me just kind of grinding through every single thing which has happened in my life. So that's really powerful. So Dean has played a massive part towards your success. The biggest, the biggest, the, like I said, I literally attest, I, 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 how do I say, I, all my success comes from Allah. Do you get what I mean? He, he, he gave me the ingredients and I bake the cake, essentially. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. uh, that's, that's what I feel. Allah gives a lot of people the ingredients, the opportunities. They just, they don't want to bake the cake. They'd rather go and to the shops and get the cake bought themselves and yeah. they don't learn the lesson. For a ready-made cake. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, so what would your advice be for people that are wanting to pray or maybe improve their deen? Like, what advice would you give them? Because you're on the ball, you're praying five times a day. I've seen everything that you're doing. So for people that are trying to, Close to their deen, but maybe you're just not quite there yet. What's your advice to them? Keep your salah between you and Allah. Keep your faith between you and Allah. And elaborate on that. Just on the, on the point that you made, you said that I pray five times a day, but yeah. you've never actually seen me on my social media pray. Yeah, yeah, just so, videos. Yeah, yeah Exactly. Yeah. So because I speak about religion a lot and because I, I, I promote my faith a lot, people will be under the assumption that I pray five times a day. You yeah. know? By Allah, we should all try to pray five times a day. But <clears throat> there's a big trend right now on social media where people, for the aesthetics, will want to show themselves praying. Actions are according to intentions. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm not putting anybody down for that or you, anything. Maybe it's my intentions which are not in the right place. But the main thing is that you don't want to, evol in, in, you don't want to involve too many people with your relationship with Allah. Like, say, for example, if you're in a marriage, okay, and, you, you know, you're married and you're with your spouse, you don't want to involve your in-laws, you don't want to involve your friends, you don't want to involve everybody within that relationship, do you? Because that 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 marriage is valuable and it's a sanctity between you and your wife. Now, just look at it from the relationship aspect of it, between one human and their Lord, okay? You want to keep that relationship close with you and Allah. You don't want to show it to many people. You don't want to just flaunt your your relationship to everybody. But that doesn't mean that you sin in public as well. That doesn't mean that you sin in public and then you're like, oh, you know what, my relationship with Allah is, is, is top notch. Because again, actions are according to intentions. And once you purify your intentions, the actions will follow. And if you are struggling with deen and if you are struggling to pray, then the, the main thing I'd say is start by the first salah. You know, don't you don't have to aim to try and pray every single prayer from the get-go if you've never really prayed. It's a challenge, it's tough, and you get overwhelmed. Even though we, we should and we must be praying five times a day as Muslims, not an excuse, no excuse whatsoever. You're working, you do it. You're with a patient, you pray. You're with your family, you pray. You're outside, you pray. You, you're at the gym, you pray, wherever. The world has been made a resource for us to pray. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has, has granted us the opportunity to pray wherever we want. There's no water around you, you do tayammum. There is water, you pray with the water. You've got a water bottle in your car, you use that water bottle, you use it scarcely. So I think people complicate religion too much. People complicate faith too much. And it's simple. Hold your religion very close to your heart. Make intention to pray, to pray salah. Don't let a sin pull you away from Allah. If you're in a haram relationship, don't let, don't let that be the reason why you don't pray. If you're smoking weed, don't let that be the reason why you don't pray. And that's what happens. People fall into one sin. Yeah. And what that happens is they start to stop praying. They veer away from their religion. But that, that's not how it should be. That's essentially shaitan, the, you know, the, how we look at it, the devil, his whispers. That's what he wants because he wants you to turn away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We want to draw. We want to get closer to him. Yeah, I think that's really good advice for the for the viewers. Everyone makes mistakes, and everyone uh, commits their own sins in their own way. And I do feel like sometimes when you have maybe committed a sin, you're just like, ah, oh, well, I've just done that. Well, what's the point of me praying now? You know, I've yeah. made that mistake. Exactly. Uh, so you just end up missing all your prayers, and it just prolongs and and escalates from there. So that's really good advice. Um, and then just touching back briefly uh, upon when you mentioned failure and how you deal with failure, I just want to quickly. Uh, touch upon that if somebody is in business now uh, a lot of our viewers are watching this they've got businesses they're trying so if uh, you hit a barrier where you know people are uh, for example for myself when i'm calling clients mm. and they're ignoring my calls mm. or uh, so i'm not getting anywhere i'm speaking to gatekeepers and i'm just getting rejection after rejection after rejection that even for me now after 10 years is disheartening and uh, it can affect your mood it can affect your day it can affect your mindset and you can switch into a negative mindset what advice would you give for people that are experiencing those failures 
and uh, hitting that brick wall where it's it's easy to say just be positive and optimistic but in reality they do you know affect you and mm. uh, they do affect your mood and you know what you're doing and and you start to have those seeds of doubt and am I doing the yeah. right thing what kind of advice would you give I think it's a very good question actually and from my experience because of the industries that I'm in you're used to rejection you're used to failure moving into private healthcare it's not just now just dispensing or giving a hearing aid you're actually selling it you know the the, the patient has to pay for it with clients um if if I'm helping my assistant out on sales calls um with my coaching you know I'm 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 used to a lot of rejection if with create a focus um a couple or a business has chosen to go with somebody else that's disheartening and you just get in you know hit from left right and center with rejection and the main thing you have to ask yourself is what's your why what is your why and once you've established your why the how becomes a lot easier because the re- the rejection is just a reality if you think that you're not going to fail and you're not going to be in rejection you're not going to face rejection you're living in fairy tale land because rejection is a part of the growth you know failing is a part of the growth and if you can't accept that then you're not going to go far and um you know the reason why you are in the position that you are today is you you accepted that you know what some days are going to be bad some days are going to be great some days i'm probably going to pray all my prayers some days every client is going to answer my calls some days everything is going to go the way i want it to but those days where it doesn't go the way you want it to is how you respond to that it's how receptive you are to that which shapes how you will then be for the days that that to come that are very positive and that do um bear the fruits of your labor so it's taking it back right to the beginning is what's your why and establish your why because then you have clarity in your vision and then those drawbacks or setbacks they won't put you back as much you take them as lessons in the time and not as failures you don't have to wait 3 years down the line to realize that wait that actually was a lesson you can actually in that moment realize and think wait this is a lesson what can i learn from this lesson so i just want to touch upon your business ventures now and just break them down so let's start with the uh, creative focus I just touch upon that a little bit so um one of the things of the CEO club is people are coming from different uh, industries different backgrounds different <coughs> business ventures and a lot of the viewers want to see if they potentially want to start up a business in your industry what they would need uh, how mm. they would go about it so uh, for any viewers that are maybe watching for the creative focus side and they want to start mm. their own uh, video photography yeah. uh, business uh, talk to me about that what's the sort of pros and cons for that what's your sort of experience with that and where would you where would you give them the yeah. advice so I'll, i'll break it down really simply each business model i'll break it down you yeah. want to get into videography photography yeah um and i'm going to say this is exactly the way that i did it okay. this is the way this is the exact way that i have now built these successful businesses and alhamdulillah you know i can, i hope they continue to grow videography photography creative focus um i just used to edit a lot of videos my gym videos and but i never used to record myself because i had my cameraman okay when i then realized that i want to start um creating creating content and making this into a business in terms of for other businesses and just seeing what's out there um i took it more seriously so going back to what i said creative focus message as many businesses as you can i message i think 50 60 businesses and um, saying i'll do some free work for you um you know um to build my portfolio uh 10 of them got back to me i think i did a shoot with four of them and then that built it from there after the fourth one i started to charge okay so first of all if if you're not a creator if you haven't got a portfolio build your portfolio don't be afraid to do free work okay a lot of people will say don't do free work but don't be afraid to do it okay because i didn't have much skills so i didn't i, I had that imposter syndrome where i didn't want to charge my you know i didn't want to charge them extortionate amounts and secondly don't look for the best camera the best phone anything like that you know i get a ton of messages people asking me oh you know the quality is so sick what do you use what camera do you use what phone do you use for your stories i'm like bro i'm i'm still recording with an iphone 11 pro most of my vlogs and what i'm doing in the gym i've just mastered the art of lighting angles and composure and that's from learning in everything that i did so don't be afraid so to you learn started off with your iphone yeah, basically i started i started from the iphone 6s with, with wow. any any form of recording and then bought a camera and then invested into cameras i think first camera was about 400 pound then bought a lens changed in between lens lenses but initial kind of investment was a couple of 100 pound okay okay so be willing to learn be willing to do free work and stop expecting results straight away instantaneous instantaneous results because it's not going to happen and 
if you can implement these, you're going to go a long way because you don't have you don't have um, arrogance towards you when you when you're looking at when you are looking to do free work when you do build your portfolio. Just do it. Do it because you enjoy it. Don't do it because you have to. Because if you start off with it thinking, I want to make a lot of money from this, it's not going to happen. I didn't start a single one of my businesses, anything like that, thinking I want to make a lot of money in this. I just thought I want to enjoy it. Enjoy it first. And then after you've got something that makes you money that you enjoy, then maybe you've built that capital, do something else now that you that you might not really enjoy that much, but you see the potential for it. In terms of startup, just quickly going about that. So what would you say is a figure that you need to start? You can start off with literally just your iPhone. Yeah. How do you then do the editing side of things? Are you, do you just learn that yourself or? Yeah, um, so to this day, I still have a pirated version of Final Cut Pro on my on my MacBook. Okay. Uh, when I started 2018, I couldn't afford a Final Cut Pro. And so um, I just kind of, I just searched the internet, downloaded a virus as well, unfortunately, but okay. I got a free Final Cut Pro, which was 300 pound at the time. And at the time that was, a lot, I mean, still a lot of money now, but at the time for me, I was thinking, you know, well, I can't afford this. So I thought I still want to create content. But to break it down really simply, all you need is your phone. All you need is a splice, cap cut, InShot, any of these, you can get free versions of them as well to edit. Okay. The editing apps. Yeah. CapCut is free. If you want to use CapCut to edit, that's free. You can do that. Splice, you can use that for free as well. There's a paid version of it as well. Every single resource that that's available is there for free. So if you really want to get started in the creative industry, you just need your phone. Get download an app from the from App Store. Like I said, Splice or CapCut. There is a free version and play around with it. They're the only two things you need to get started at first. I wanted to start at a slightly different level when I was doing promotional work for businesses. So I bought a camera. The camera was a A6000, which I sometimes still use, 400 pounds. I bought a Sigma lens, 280 pounds, 680 pounds. I saved up like three months for that. And the, the return on investment on that has been absolutely crazy. Yeah. So you don't need a lot of money to start off at all. Okay. Um, that's uh, that's really good advice. And uh, what would your advice be to people wanting to start up their videography and photography business in terms of, is it something that is lucrative? Is it something that can benefit you in the end? It's competitive. Okay. But every single business is lucrative. Every single, every single opportunity there is, is lucrative. There's money to be made from everything. It's just how you market yourself and how you present yourself and and how much work you're willing to do. You know, there's there's people making six figures plus seven figures even from selling toys on YouTube, um, you know, promoting that and selling it on Amazon, affiliate marketing, um, you know, associating, them, associating themselves with other brands. There's a huge amount of opportunity there. It's competitive. The creative industry is a very competitive industry because there is a ton of people which are better than me. I'm, I'm a pretty basic videographer and photographer. I'll yeah. say that myself. I'm not that talented. But where where I lack in talent, I excel in my drive and my amb- and my ambition. And that's what you have to have. Where you think that you might lack in talent, you have to excel in another area and that will take you forward in your business. Okay. Yeah. A lot of people probably be interested in how you once they've seen your content, how you actually edit your reels and your I don't know if I don't know what you name them, but you know, Mm. like the animated sort of uh, neon signals and all the infographics and all that kind of stuff. So even myself, I'm interested in that to be fair. So I'm asking for myself, (laughs) how on earth do you edit those and how do you get them to look so like uh, professional? And and that's what captures me whenever you post Mm. is when you're doing your weight training and then you've got your little line that goes, this is yeah. chest and this is working this part of your muscle. And it just engages me more than a basic video of somebody talking mm. because you're seeing all these animations pop up and mm. just gives it that little bit more of a professional look. So firstly, how how did you learn that and, and how do you do that? I learned from YouTube, everything from YouTube. I downloaded loads of free kind of elements that I could then sync into Final Cut Pro. I literally used to search uh, free uh, call outs, they're called call outs um, on YouTube. And I used to find um, people who were like kind of putting them on for free, I should download them, convert them into a file um, and then export it into Final Cut Pro. That was that. And then I went into a paid subscription, it's called Envato Elements. Right? So you can use that. that. Yeah, so that. it's like 25 pound a month and it's got everything on there that I create and needs. There's, there's a lot more websites where you can where you can kind of get things for, but just search gym graphics. That's what I searched back then when I, I was creating, I was very heavy more on that kind of gym content and spending a lot yeah. of time, spending about two, three hours on a piece of content. I just do not have the facilities or the time to do that anymore. Is so that what a reel would take? Like It used to take that long. Wow. Now I can I can box off a reel within about half an hour, 40 minutes, you know, any kind of content I create now because I kind of create in batch, I edit in batch and I keep the 
the work a lot more streamlined as well. And that came from knowing how to run a streamlined business with my coaching, with creative focus and kind of everything that I do really. Okay. So that's really interesting, uh, interesting from that side of thing. And then to touch upon your other business, Coaching by Riaz. Uh, so talk to me about that. That came about just as an idea, really. You know, I wanted to be, I wanted to help people. And as cliche as it sounds, oh, you know, everybody wants to help people. But at the same time, I wanted to make money from it as well. I wanted, I wanted, I didn't want to be in a position where I saw my parents when I was younger. I didn't want to be, you know, you know, rummaging for scraps and, you know, trying to, it's not saying that my parents did that, but, they, 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 you know, uh, um, not literally, but in the sense where you just feel like you just got enough to, to get by. I didn't want to be in that position. So Coach Barrias then came about from the idea of me wanting to reach a lot of people and to scale. I couldn't scale with my eBooks that I sold for 13 99 uh, I think you bought one a couple of years ago. It's pretty informative to be fair. I think I've still got it. <laughs> I was searching my emails. Yeah, I helped I think, out a lot. Exactly. So I spent six months building that, as I mentioned yeah. at the beginning of the podcast, and it just wasn't scalable for me. So I spent another six to eight months trying to build a web- website and again, I just couldn't do it, man. I want, with the thing with me is I'm a perfectionist. I want to do everything, you know, exactly spot on. One of my downfalls and again, something which um, kind of separates me from the rest. And I, I say that with no pride. I just say it in the sense that I've put in two, three, four times the amount of hours anybody else has, you know, within this industry. Do you know what I mean? You know, I, alhamdulillah, I came into it very early on, even though I'm not excelling in it. There's tons of others which are, you know, way ahead of me. Um, I've built that discipline and that control over, you know, knowing that a lot of these things are temporary. You know, this this isn't the only metric for success, you know, the followers or um, the number of clients or anything like that. So that's how I realized, how do I now excel the coaching? How do I expand it? So, uh, you know, build it with a company, they built the software for me. And we had a lot of meetings in terms of trying to get my website correct because I, I couldn't make it streamlined. I don't know how to code, you know, I might know yeah. how to do a few things, but there's a lot of things which I don't yeah, know how to do. Yeah, complicated. And so I wanted to have a platform where I could do everything, you know, and provide a five-star service. So build the platform, build the website, build the app. And from then really, it was just reaching the tar- reaching my target audience, knowing my target audience and really being able to provide value and that's what it always comes back to you can't just um slap a certificate on and say you're a pt and and then be like, okay i'm going to start coaching people you know the that the, the personal training industry and the fitness industry is highly saturated yeah. and instead of trying to just be someone you know really uh, separate yourself from the rest just find your niche identify your niche and triple down on that niche so i gave 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 and then i asked my followers knew that i'm going to continue to give content and i didn't just provide i didn't just give content to then secure a client yeah that just was a byproduct of me trying to be as genuine as i can conveying a message which i i believe in and then people believed in me and once people believe in you people believe in your product and the way it works with me is i am the product because um all of the product essentially is in here because every, a lot of what I do is digital. You know, I don't really have a, a, a physical business other than the creative focus, really. But again, that's digital where I'm selling digi- um, physical products or anything like that. So essentially the brand, the, the, the product is me. So I have to convey myself in a way where I'm genuine because as I mentioned before, people will realize and they can smell it from a mile off when you're not genuine. Yeah. And that's with anything. If you if you are looking to get into the online coaching world, you know, identify your target audience, create content for your target audience within around that niche, keep on creating content. Don't give up after a month if, if your reels didn't go viral. Do it for a month, two months, three months, and then look at pages which are doing well, creators which are doing well, coaches which are doing well, and kind of piggyback off that Take some, take some knowledgeable content of them. It's called a unicorn method where you look at somebody who's really successful in your field and you look at what they're doing and then you take what they've done and you just reverse engineer that into your own aspect. A lot of what I've done is kind of reverse engineer what I've seen from a lot of creators, but then add my own twist to it. And then what happens then is I'm not copying, I'm being genuine. I'm taking an idea and I'm just extrapolating different things from that and making it into my own. Okay, so how much did it cost you to start up the, the that business? Because I'm assuming getting website code, is that, that just sounds expensive. Are you willing to put a figure on it? Or? <laughs> Take a guess. Well, I, the first website I made, 
was a recruitment website and it was so basic and I think I got ripped off. I paid about three and a half grand <laughs> and it was so basic. Uh, just some coders from Birmingham and they were like, yeah, we'll make you an amazing website. Give them a few images. They made yeah. the most basic website. I'm talking like homepage, about us page, you know, like anything you could have done yourself. Yeah. And I was getting excited that I'm starting a business and I need professional people to make the website and I was just getting a bit over the, over excited and I paid three and a half grand for that. Mm. So I'm probably assuming I got ripped off looking at it now and how easy yeah. it is to make a website. Yeah. Um, so that was three and a half grand for a website and then your app's quite good as well to be fair and it's quite detailed I would I would say it's hard to get that for less than five ten grand if it was me paying it I would have probably yeah. paid about well, I, would, <laughs> I would have probably paid ten grand I got ripped off maybe even more but uh, I'd probably say five to ten grand I paid nothing what? I paid nothing no way to this day I've paid nothing they, you, take, they take a revenue share Okay, so the, the money essentially, because they, they still kind of build, this, we still work together very closely on how we can build a business, right? And so they take a revenue share, okay? And wow. what I did, so they, they've changed the business model now. I I work, I got in with the business when they were fairly young, um, okay? And, uh, you know, they, they've changed a lot of how they do business now. There is a startup cost, there is, uh, you know, certain figures that you have to hit, yeah. um, you know, to then give them more of a revenue share. But mine was a, a basic, okay, you don't pay anything, we just take a revenue share month on month. And I was like, okay, happy days. I was, I, you know, I wasn't making much money then. I was like, oh, I'll take it. And so you didn't pay anything? No. Uh, and I'm assuming it probably would have been at least five thousand pound plus worth of more than that, more than more that than easily, that. Yeah. more than that. Especially with the, with the revenue I've generated from it now, yeah. I, I, I just think like you know they spent a fair bit, yeah, crazy amount. And because, it is expensive to create an app. Yeah, and I, th I think for in, in in the sense that you know, even though I didn't pay anything for it, I'm still kind of there's still a, a big chunk of a revenue share which goes out um, every month. Um, however, because Obviously, it's, it's changed now, but to do my personal training course, I think that was about two grand or something like that. And, you know, a lot of these things were, did add up sometimes, but I always looked for the free way of doing things. You get what yeah. I mean? I always looked at, okay, look, there is always free material Smart. out there to, you know, to, to consume knowledge. Yeah. And I'm a consumer of content in the sense that how can I better myself for this? Like Canva, I've used Canva for years. For the first couple of months, I didn't, I didn't pay for it. And because I just used the free stuff, but then when it started, when I started to make money from other things, I then paid a subscription, ten pound a month or something like that. And you know, it's just investing in yourself. Is that where you create all the graphics and stuff, isn't it? Or is um, it Canva? I've heard of it. So I, I use Canva. I use Canva. I use Final Cut Pro. I use Photoshop. I use CapCut. I use Splice. Um, I use sometimes. I what else do I use? Uh, in Stories for Stories. And uh, so you know. Probably like my kind of what I pay a month for like different apps is probably close to like probably a like hundred pounds a month and um, just on different or like hundred and twenty, I think so it is. Bad. Um, but when you think of like how much money that that makes you, you know that that's, that's, that's pennies a small compared investment, yeah. pennies compared to what it makes you. So it's just it's just what it's down to. How much you're willing to give, you know, for what you believe in and what what you're passionate about. So you can really start a coaching business with a, a little amount of money as well. You can start a coaching yeah. business with no money. There's yeah. coaches out there right now. They're not personal trainers. They don't need to be personal trainers. You do not need to be a personal trainer to be an online coach. You do need to have an abundance of knowledge because you're changing people's lives. To have that certification helps you and it, it helps you quite a lot. And that's why I'm, I'm not just trying to be, okay, I'm qualified in nutrition. I'm qualified in personal training, but... I'm trying to take it to the next level now, right now. I'm trying to, okay, I work with patients. I'm working towards now being a cognitive behavioral therapist and implementing that with my clients as well. I'm trying to be at the top of my game, okay? okay? And people need to aim to be at the top of their game. You can't just, you know, build a pretty website and then call yourself a coach. You have to be, you have to have knowledge to back that. To build a website, it's free. You can build a free website on Wix. Um, that's what I built my recruitment website on. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I spent a lot of time on that. You can Squarespace, you can build websites on that. You know, you can integrate things very nicely. And, and then you just go forth and create content. A lot of the way that I made money was by doing things which were free. But the free things were very difficult to do. Yeah. I just I just sought it a lot of the time. I just put my head down, put in the hours, and I thought, you know what, you know, it's free. I'm gonna try and do as much as I can from this, learn as much as I can from this, and then just take it from there. It's the right way to do things. To be fair, it's the smart way to do things. I think I made a lot of mistakes looking back and and sort of being uh, overexcited and just spending lots of money and hiring loads of people and just spending thousands. Yeah. 
uh, where you look back and the way that you've done it is definitely the smarter way yeah. uh, that I'd probably advise uh, viewers to follow your yeah. way as opposed to mine. So just touching upon quickly some uh, physical and, and sort of gym health uh, advice. Yeah. So for yourself, let's just split the gym into uh, training and dieting. So give the viewers some advice on uh, on sort of training first. Uh, if we haven't trained, uh, trying to get into the gym, what would be your best advice? Aim for two to three days a week. Okay. Like just take a very low intensity at first. The most common thing I get, you know, I've worked with people from tons of different countries, with hundreds of different people. And the main thing that I see with them is they try and go, you know, full throttle, you know, first thing. And yeah. then what happens is you lose the momentum and you lose the drive, you lose the motivation because initially you're really, you're using motivation to fuel you. Go two to three times a week. Okay. Skip some days. It's fine. You know, uh, a consistent routine that has breaks in it and that has flaws within it is much better than you just sitting around and planning to do, waiting for the perfect time to get to the gym, to start a diet. A diet, again, does not have to be restrictive. The easiest way to gain muscle, lose fat and just become healthier is just by following very simple steps is calculate, figure out what's your, um, your maintenance calories, okay? Now, whether you want to be in a deficit, minus about, 20 to 30% of those okay. calories to then figure out your deficit. If you want to be in a surplus, again, 20 to 30% to then figure out what your surplus will be to then want to gain weight. So that's very simple. You've got your calories figured out right now, okay? Right. You don't necessarily have to track it. Just be mindful of it and wary of, you know, the different nutritional value and calories that different food groups hold. Okay. Yeah, so you've got your nutrition sorted there. Now in terms of the workout, again... Just nutrition, just yeah. to talk about nutrition, what would you say, uh, proteins, fats, uh, carbs, is there like a split that you recommend? You don't need to worry or? about that. You do not do need not. to worry about that. People worry about the. You know, a lot of my clients, I don't even tell them to worry about that anymore. So they can just eat as long as they get in. Eat what they want. You know what? I literally, the recipes that I create for my clients, biryani, roti, dal, um, curries, pizza, um, chicken wraps, all of this... Diff, just healthier alternatives to what you yeah. normally think. And this is the kind of food that they eat and they lose weight because um, a diet shouldn't be restrictive. It should help you and it should it should be something that you want to do. So once you've got the the, the, the nutrition aspect sorted, okay. train two to three two to three days a week, you know, to just to start off with, maybe for the first two to three weeks and then bump it up to maybe four days to go, I mean, implement at least one day of cardio in there, two days of cardio in there. You've got your workout sorted now. Split it, maybe chest and triceps, back and biceps, legs, shoulders. I spoke about this in one of my videos. There, yeah. done. Four days of workouts, done. I did another video of actually, I gave a full workout plan of what you can do. Go on my page, it's done. There for I'll you. link that in the bio. Yeah. yeah. Follow, the, follow those steps. It's literally as easy as that. And then you're going to be on a way to creating a very good foundation to the physique that you want to build. People look at me, they think I eat healthy. Wallahi, I probably eat out two to three times a week. I'll go George's, Virginia's, I'll get a chicken burger all the time. I don't watch what I eat. I haven't watched what I eat for the past three years. The thing is, I built the foundation of building, um, um, you know, a pretty decent physique um, over the, you know, the course of four years where I was, you know, very strict with it. And I followed a certain regimen of doing things. But then when I, when my physique got to a level where I'm like, you know what, I'm pretty happy with this. I'm just going to maintain and then slowly start to increase. I'm freestyling it now doing what works for me, doing what works around my lifestyle. But people try to do that at the beginning yeah. and they fail. Do you get what I mean? Try freestyling at the beginning. Any supplements you recommend taking none. or no? None. None. You don't need any supplements. Nothing. No supplements. The first probably six months of your training, forget about supplements. Okay. Just worry about food, worry about your training. Supplements out the window. Anybody tries to tell you, you know, have this supplement, slap them. <laughs> is that, is that, listen, you're going to get a personal trainers all arguing in the comments here. People worry about it too much, man. Trust me. You know, it is. I think what I've seen in the personal trainer industry is there's a lot of I'm right, you're right, this is the right way to do things. So, you know, one personal trainer will post something and all of a sudden, you know, you've got all the other guys yeah. commenting, being smart asses and, yeah. Yeah, well, this is not the right way or you shouldn't be saying this. And there's probably a million ways to skin a cat and there's probably loads of ways to do it. But exactly. I think everyone has their own versions out there. You just got to keep it right. simple. You know, weight loss, weight gain is simple, people okay. complicate it. Like I just gave a very simple kind of method to do it, whether it's weight gain or weight loss. If people follow that, they can, but people just want, you know, they want like the, the quick pill, the quick fix, you know, what, yeah, what's, they, they're, they're always looking for the option. magic pill and what's what's kind of thing. And they don't realize that the most simple things is right in front of them. Yeah. So what kind of guys do you, do you get the soft guys that just come in and want the easiest route and... Depends, it depends. But if I, if I do the consultation call, it depends. Um, I feel that working with female clients is better okay. a lot of the time because they're just more adherent to a plan 
and they'll do it they'll do it a lot more and a lot of my majority of my clients um, are mothers okay with kids and maybe because they've got that discipline where they've got their kids and they know how to manage their time and they work as well so that's a lot of my female client base it's mothers who busy mothers who just want to keep fit a lot of the guys again it's busy guys who want to keep fit but then you have the odd bunch where they'll message me after a month um, you know I keep in very close contact with all of my clients and they say oh I'm not losing any weight I'm not doing this like bro I didn't see any progress for like six months and you're complaining about a month. Shut up and just carry on. I just wanted that instant result. Yeah, you know, it's like even, even looking for something after three months is instant. Shut yeah. up. Just just, yeah. <laughs> just put, put in the work to get, I mean, people just constant you need, instant gratification. You know, it's, it's, again, it's social media. Everyone's got abs, everyone's got, yeah. you know, muscles, everybody's looking a certain way. So you, I think there is definitely a lot of pressure for, for people to look their absolute best because if you're not looking good, you're not getting attention you know you know same goes for suits people want to look good people buy exactly. suits from us just you know to take snaps and saying that they're wearing bespoke suits they don't even care about the suits they're just exactly. literally for social media for the gram uh, and that's the sort of generation that we're living in it's all for attention it does work you do get attention yeah. if you look good you know you've got uh, muscles and you're wearing nice suits or whatever it is but again I think it's down to the individual. It's a double like sword, really, with anything, with the social media aspect of it. You can really use it to um, pursue a lot of the things you want to, or you can just do use it as a, a materialistic outlet for the things that you're not happy with in your life. So what you're going to do is seek that validation and look at other people who have got what you don't. You're then going to envy that individual because you don't. You just see the result. You just see the product of. You don't see everything that's happening in between. Hence why I've always shared my journey. You, you would have seen hundreds of time lapses of me on my stories, just working away okay. wherever I've worked and from the bottom. Bro, do you know how much I used to pay in rent when I was in Leeds when I was living as a student? Take a guess how much I used to pay um, a week. I don't know. You're a hustler, to be fair. You're smart with your money. If it was me, it'd probably be like over a grand. So I'd probably, for you, two, fifty, three hundred a week, 400 a week is Leeds, to be fair. In Leeds, yeah. 400 a week. I paid £39 per week. Flipping hell, I'm I work, I lived in the cheapest house in the whole of Leeds. Wow. Christopher Lane, Woodhouse, Christopher Road. I lived with one near of my Woodhouse boys. Near Woodhouse Lane Car Park, near the big, right, central. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No way. And I tell, I tell you what, you know when my friends used to come to my come to my place, drive from Manchester, come to mine, they'd be like, bro, do you live in a brothel? <laughs> <laughs> the door, the, the door was a boarded up black door. It was just a black door, okay. No, and um, the, it was gated as well, and then it had a fence, like and in one was... gate, and um, it was a four bed, okay. And um, there was one guy that lived there. He moved back to Nigeria, but when I tell you that it was, it was the, Hell it, it, it smelled. But I, I, I kind of, comp- I, I transformed it. So I lived with um, like one of my closest boys there. I met him in in, in uni, and what really humbled me was. My guy was working as a stockbroker in Leeds. Yeah. Yeah. Probably 20 years old. Um, you know, working in, working in trading as a stockbroker. He's, Alhamdulillah, he's earning a lot of money at a very young age. And, you know, Alhamdulillah, he's very successful now. And I take a lot of wisdom from him. You know, I look up to him a lot. And when I knew that he was living there and how much he was earning and what he's, I'm thinking, who the hell am I wanting to live anywhere else? Oh. I just thought, I'm going to live there. Okay, I paid, bro, the, the bathroom was, we didn't have, we didn't have hot water. I didn't pay for hot water. We, had, we never topped that up. Wow, yeah, because yeah? gas prices. So just... what we would do is, because the kitchen water was cold, okay, so what, what, what I'd, and we, so we'd wash the dishes with cold water, but then when we'd uh, wake up to do wudu, the shower was next to the sink in the toilet. So we'd get the shower head, put it in the sink, and because the shower was electric, you'd get hot water from the shower. So you used to turn the shower head on and do wudu from that. Yeah. There used to be wow. snails near to the near to the bathtub. I've got pictures of all of this. All the, this the that toilet, you lived in. The toilet seat was broken. There was damp. Um, and there was um, there was there was a few occasions of rats as well, but they went after a quick. I'm not going to c- try and you know glorify it. They were probably <laughs> one once or twice, but there were slugs on the wall. But you know we we both did a very good job of cleaning everything. Thirty nine pound a yeah. week. Yeah, one hundred and fifty eight pound a month. Um, that it was roughly that much, and that and then the bills came to like an extra twelve pound a month because we didn't really we didn't really spend any didn't money really compared to the gas bit and electric bill right yeah. now. Yeah, the, with the so cost it was of probably living. twelve pound or twenty four pound a month each on bills. Uh, because we didn't use gas, we didn't have the lights on. Um, I used to have candle in my room, and then I used to use the light as well sometimes. And I used to have an electric heater, which I used to use at night as well. And 
I think it's inspirational to be fair and uh, talking on this topic because so many people are going to be experiencing the cost of living crisis yeah. and gas and electric bills hours have gone four or five times what they used to be you know from paying 150 to now 500 plus every month exactly it, you know people can't afford that so um, it's inspirational that you're, you're exactly. talking about that and uh, on the topic of cost of living what would you what advice would you give to people that maybe can't afford the bills and what are going through difficult times at this moment in time reduce your expenditure I think reduce your expenditure and increase your income. And some people, some people might look and and think and be like, you know, oh, my situation is different to yours. This situation is different, and everything is everything is circumstantial. But at yeah. the end of the day, if you can reduce your expenditure and increase your income, you you won't feel like there's a cost of living crisis. And I can guarantee you now, you know, a lot of the people, a lot of the wealthier people now, they don't really feel the cost of living crisis. Do you get what I mean? And yeah. if you want to be in that position where, okay, people have families to feed and people, it's, like I said, it's very circumstantial. Yeah. But it just goes back to any expenditure that you have, which is not necessarily, maybe eat out less, um, you know, because yeah. eating out is, is, is expensive. Reduce that expenditure, increase your income, increase your, you know, increase how much you make. And before people say, to, you know, say, I don't have enough time. I don't have enough time. Shut up. You do yeah. have time. Do you get what I mean? Time. Yeah. The thing is, people think that, you know, the, the biggest lie we tell ourselves is that we have poor time management. When yeah. it's not time management, it's self-management. Time isn't tangible. You can't grab time and hold time and pause that time. Time is not going to wait for you. Time is going to carry on ticking, right? Whereas money, if you think, if you you can have good money, man, man, you can have good money management. If I gave you a 10 pound note right now, you can hold that 10 pound note, can't you? Can you yeah. see it? Yeah. Can you feel it? Yeah. yeah. It's tangible. You can see that. You can you can manage your money, okay? Can you manage your emotions? Of course you can because it's a part of who you are and you can use different methods and different elements of discipline to control your emotions, to control who you are. But you can't manage time. You can't control time. So when somebody says, I have poor time, you know, um, I don't have the time for it. My, you know, my time management is all over the place and that's, that's, that's a load of rubbish. Your self-management is all over the place. If you can compartmentalize your time and do the things that, provide value to you then yeah absolutely how many people now who work a nine to five will come home from their nine to five and they're like oh, do you know what Oof, hard day i want to chill yeah. i want to watch netflix not that there's anything wrong with netflix but if you're in a position where you're struggling then you're doing those things where you don't want to improve and then you're going to be in that same situation you know if you carry on constantly doing the things that you always do you're going to be in the same position you always were in and it, that, that, that just that's just how it works do you get what i mean again if people have people who they're caring for you know family members who are extremely ill kids who are extremely ill again that is very circumstantial but i'm talking about the layman the typical you know within within our age range even within the 30s within the 20s a lot of the time the uni students are working excuses, yeah. you know what i mean they'll come home from work and they'll chill and then they complain about things if you're in that position then that's down to you it's not down to not having enough time you know and it's not about oh everybody has the same amount of hours in the in in, in the you know, in their days, but everyone has the same amount of information available to them. What's available to me is available to you and available to every single viewer here. So how do you get the motivation for people that may be lacking motivation to actually go out and make the most out of their, their time and utilize their time efficiently? What is your driving force and what would you recommend? I'm not motivated. You're well, not. Like, I lost that motivation years ago. Okay. You just have to be disciplined. And how do you get disciplined? It's by not relying on motivation at the beginning. What people do is they get fueled by motivation at the beginning. Okay, use that to fuel you. But if you're completely relying on motivation to do something, then what you're doing is you're you're just relying on a feeling. You're relying on your emotions. Okay. Discipline isn't an emotion. It's a way of living, and it's 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 more than it's more than just a thought process. It's more than just a bunch of chemical reactions that happen when we're motivated. It's 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 more than just dopamine being released, and that's what happens. If say for example, um, you only went to work to work on your business when you were motivated. You'd be out of business right now. This yeah. wouldn't be the CEO club. This would be the bankrupt club, bro. <laughs> you get what I mean? Yeah, like that. <laughs> Do you get what I mean? Yeah. So if 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 you're constantly relying on motivation, constantly relying on that on that good feeling to do something, you're going to be a slave to your emotions and you're not going to get anywhere. So how do you stay disciplined then? Well, you, you build habit, you build consistency. Yeah. You have to do something um, over a long period of time and sustain that. You have to have longevity in whatever you do. And once you have longevity, you then have results and then you have consistency. That consistency will start to breed results. Results don't get 
you know, they're not born from just being motivated all the time. I mean, you can have motivation. It's good. There's nothing wrong with being motivated, but don't use that as your, your driving force to do whatever you want to do. It has to be then converted into discipline. And it's the discipline that gets you the results Absolutely. when you're consistent. And that's something that I've seen with you every single day when you're posting uh, the stuff that you're doing. Uh, we're going to quickly touch upon day in the life of. Yeah. So your day in the life of, you'll post videos where I'll show you waking up in the morning, your morning routine and everything that you're doing in a day, uh, which is jam packed. I've got a busy diary, but everything that you manage to do in a day is amazing. How do you, how do you manage to be so productive in the day? And just maybe quickly talk me through a normal day. I don't know. No? Wallahi, honesty, I don't know how I do it. People ask me all the time, like, how do you do it? And I genuinely don't know. Like, I sleep four and a half to five hours a day, um, five to six days a week. And like I said, as I was saying before, like, Allah blesses us in different ways. I, f I genuinely feel like I probably have more than 24 hours in a day. <laughs> That's yeah. just how it feels sometimes for me. I feel like, how am I getting so much done? And I, I can't say that it's I wake up at 6 a.m. every day and I do this every day. And I, But sometimes I, I'm, I'm wasting time on my phone. I'm just sat there thinking a lot of the time, what am I going to do? Like, I genuinely, wholeheartedly, I don't know. <laughs> you are really productive with your time, to be fair. You you don't. It looks like you utilise every minute of every hour in, in a productive way. Obviously, but, social media can be deceptive. Yeah, and I don't. Um, that's the thing. I don't. Do you get what I mean? Like, today I woke up, what... 7.55, something like that. And I realized, damn, five minutes left for Fajr. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. But then some days I'm waking up just before work and I'm quickly getting ready. I don't eat breakfast or anything like that. Some days I come home from work and I'm so tired. But to make myself want to feel productive, I'll just get dressed, I'll sit at my desk, but I'll watch Netflix on my desk. So then it then kind of gears me and it primes me to then after I've ate, I'll turn Netflix off and I get to work. But a lot of the too. time, it's, you know, I'm kind of winging it, to be honest, bro. Like, I just feel like Allah has given me something which I haven't figured out yet, which allows me to just continuously do what I want to do. But when is this podcast going to be released, by the way? It'll probably be coming up uh, soon, maybe in a few weeks. A few weeks? Yeah. Less than four weeks or more than four Less weeks? Less than four weeks, probably. Okay. The reason why I say that, yeah. because I'm quitting my career Okay. as a private audiologist. Okay. I'm actually handing my notice in on Tuesday. No way. Yeah. I've got a little CEO club exclusive. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. So um I've been in the I've been in I've been in the job for about three and a bit months. The thing is, I run multiple clinics, right? And I'm driving back and forth and I genuinely just struggling with time and energy. Like I'm depleted a okay. lot of the time. Do you get what I mean? And like I'm not going to the gym. Luckily I'm injured. Well, luckily and unluckily, like I don't feel as bad for not training because I'm injured. I train probably twice a week now, right? But I'm I'm leaving because even though I love it, like I know I can scale businesses a lot more if I put hundred percent into it. Yeah. And I just don't have the energy for that. I'm still gonna be doing stuff within audiology, but more so not under employment, but kind of scaling that to somewhere where I Something, something different. So this is the next step. That's the next step for me. Like I, I enjoy what I do, but I also love creating content and I love coaching people. And for me, looking at it in terms of how much energy I, I spend on it, it's just I'm, it's, it's a diff, it's a difficult decision because you know, Alhamdulillah, if if you're in any you know private healthcare sector, it's very lucrative. You know, you can make a lot of money from it. Um, but it just got to a point for me. I. I don't really care how much money I make from it if I'm not excelling to the maximum on the things where I want to do. So you've done it the right way, to be fair. And I think for the viewers, a lot of people that start side hustles and, you know, leave their jobs from what I've seen. If you leave too soon and you're needing your side hustle and your passion to bring in financial income straight away, yeah. it sometimes takes the enjoyment out of the whole process. Uh, whereas the way that you've done it, uh, martial is amazing because you've you've sort of built it up whilst you've had your all your hands in different pies and now you're able to leave and you've built a platform where you actually can afford to leave. Yeah. Uh, what would your advice be to people in that situation? Would you, you know, maybe mm. starting a side income, working full time? What's your thoughts on that? Okay. Um, have a six month safety net financially um, so that if you were to quit your job tomorrow, you can survive for six months exactly the way you're living now. That's the first step, okay? That's the minimum. The minimum should be have a six-month safety net. Okay. Second of all, if you work in a nine-to-five, this might be the routine. Okay, let's just say, for example, you wake up, say, 6.30, 7 a.m., an hour commute to work. You get to work for nine o'clock, okay? 
you come back, you finish work, you come back probably half six, okay, realistically. You're tired, you you know, you want to eat a bit, relax a bit. So realistically, talking about it very realistically, probably between the hours of 8 p.m. to say 11 p.m. or even 12 a.m. midnight, if you want to sacrifice a bit of sleep, those are your hours to really build something. Or if you want to do it the other way around, wake up a lot more earlier, so sleep at probably 10 p.m. or something like that, wake up at 5 a.m., an hour or two before you're supposed to actually wake up and work on your hustle then. That's exactly what I did for three to four years. I either stayed up at very late nights or I woke up extremely early or sometimes I'd have very late nights and still wake up extremely early and then utilize that. I didn't have a safety net. I didn't have enough money then. So I thought my my currency is my time right now and I'm going to make the most out of that. So have that safety net. Work on work on your side also, work on whatever you want to after you've done your job. Your job should not be the reason why you're limited from what you want to do. And expect that you might be burnt out and you have to be willing to sacrifice a lot. You have to be willing to hear from your family. You don't spend enough time with us. You don't care about your family. Why do you work so much? You know, this is not healthy. You're going to get ill. All of these things are things which my family members have said to me. My mum, my sister, my dad, my cousins, because... My brothers even, my little brothers are like, oh, Baya, you don't spend enough time with us. And I'm yeah. thinking, I'm sorry, lads, but I'll do whatever I can for you guys. But I'm just I'm just trying here. Do you know what I mean? The reason why I'm leaving my job right now is I'm burnt out, bro. Like, I'm, I'm finished. <laughs> right, now, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't think I'm working at my maximum capacity. But in terms of energy, bro, when you look at a battery, bro, like, yeah, I just yeah. can't. I can't push past that, bro. Do you get what yeah. I mean? It's like sleeping five hours a day, four and a half hours a day for the past three and a half months now, right now. It's, it's lot, just, yeah. it's, it's too much, man. And, you know, sometimes you have to know when to throw in the towel and it's not, uh, it's not because, you know, I'm failing at it or anything like that. It's just because you have to make a decision of no, I think what's going to bring more this value. This is the next level for you. And I think we're capturing it at the right moment. We'll get you on again at some point. Yeah. Uh, so sort of just to capture where your journey has gone next, but uh, this is the next level. Once you can fully commit to your businesses, you then do take it to a whole nother level. Um, so inshallah, it'll be an exciting time for you. I'm just going to finish off on a few points. So life-changing piece of advice you'd give to our viewers. Put God first. Okay. Whatever you do. Okay. What kind of habits would you, uh, would you recommend people implement? Uh, I've seen quite a few of your videos where you talk about, I mean, you know, consistency, discipline, different types of habits. What would you say are the most important habits for somebody to implement, to improve themselves in all areas of their life, whether that's work, financial, business? Pray, work out regularly. Okay. Don't consume pornographic content, whether that's female or male, and okay. spend less time on your phone. Okay. That's interesting. I think I've watched a few of your videos and uh, I think it was regarding consuming less pornographic content. What's your sort of uh, advice on that? Like, uh, obviously it's, it's, it's a touchy subject because not a lot of people talk about it, but it's really important that people actually do talk about it and show the negative side effects of our generation and the <laughs> amount of porn consumption. It's having a negative impact in so many different areas. So you, I've seen you, you're one of the braver guys that post that kind of content. You'll post it on your reels. And I've seen the comments that a lot of people, uh, then, you know, on your TikToks, I think a lot of guys are like, <laughs> like, he's probably <laughs> doing it now. That's, it. <laughs> That's what I put, I put up on uh, the wire to help with uh, to, to stop watching porn. They're like, I bet this guy's just doing it now. <laughs> they just stroll the life out of you, don't they? But at the same time, there's a lot of positive comments. And yeah. I, want, I think I read one and it was like, I'm on day two and I failed. <laughs> <laughs> but it is it's a challenge but, yeah. uh, but obviously what's your advice on that then so, so dive okay. into that a little bit more so <clears throat> the thing is right now that every single young man okay has the access to nudity naked women porn at an instant more than ever before more than anybody could have had before okay and that's extremely detrimental because that creates a false image and an expectation of what marriage or, or what relationships will be like okay now I'm talking from the guidance I've given to a lot of my clients funnily enough a lot of my clients don't come to me for fitness they don't work with me for fitness they work on me to to build better habits and a lot of them the majority of males that I work with they have a huge huge addiction to porn okay and the the reason why this is and it stems from a lot of the things the music you listen to there's a lot of vulgar words in the music you listen to and um, the content you consume on Instagram, TikTok, on social media, and your thoughts and perception of women, okay? 
And the final point is created because of what you can, what of the, of the ones previous, because of how you view things and what you consume. What you really need to do is to be able to stop is to have like a buffer. Okay. Spend as least amount of time you can alone. And what I say by this is alone being bored. You can be alone when you're busy or when you're about to sleep or something like that, but alone being bored. Okay. And always remember, and I'm talking from an Islamic point of view as well, that Allah is watching what you're doing right now. Do you know what I mean? That the moment you're, you're about to do whatever you're supposed to do, you're about to watch it. You say to yourself that God is watching me right yeah. now. And what would happen if you were to die in that state? Yeah. If you were to die in that state? So it's, it's, it's not just about, you know, constantly restraining yourself because what you don't want to do is be in a cycle where you're constantly res- restraining yourself from watching porn. You want to be in a position where you don't want to watch it at all. And that's through, as I mentioned before, I'm repeating myself, but, um, spending less time alone, watching the content that you consume, your perception and your reality of how you view women. And a lot of the time, what helps, what I work with my clients and what helps them massively as well is being sincere in your prayers. And because I know people, I've got people who I work with, they have his whole Quran, they've memorized the full Quran. Do you know what I mean? And they still have a bad addiction. Yeah. They still have a bad addiction. So it's, it's how you... Rewire your mindset isn't yeah, it? Totally. It's, 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 I've personally seen a few a few of my friends, people I know, they've there's something called PIED, I think it was porn induced erectile dysfunction, yeah, yeah. PIED or something. Yeah. And there's so many young people out there now yeah. that can't even uh, perform an act yeah. in real life yeah. because of how much yeah. online content that they've actually watched. Absolutely. Young lads, Absolutely. fit and healthy. Absolutely. And I'm glad you said that because I looked in a lot into that because my clients mentioned it to me. And I was, so I looked more into it and into the science behind it and the biochemistry behind it. Yeah. And, you know, I'm it's a man of science. I love the steep, science behind yeah. it. And when we look at it, it stems from, it's, it's going back to how when people um, are constantly seeking happiness, constantly seeking instant gratification, it, your dopamine receptors essentially get fried. You become numb to just, so that's why people can scroll endlessly. People can do nothing endlessly because they become numb to it. You have literally numbed your brain. You've numbed your, your dopamine receptors to then being in a state where effectively you're kind of in a vegetative state because you're just so used to it. It's just so normal. The same thing happens with, with pornography. Okay. People are so used to it. They've become so not, it's, it's so norm. It's a norm to them. Now that you have this pornographic induced erectile dysfunction that because it's not the way they expected it to be, they can't get it up. Yeah, and, it's just just, and, it, and, and, and it's a struggle because now what the, what's happened is they've distanced themselves from reality, they've distanced themselves from their, their, their Lord, they've distanced themselves from their faith, and now the only connection they really have to the outside world is through the screen and watching, you know, inappropriate things. Yeah, I think for the viewers that are maybe going through this, a lot of people will relate. There's something called NoFap. I don't know if you've heard of that. There's a whole community around yeah. that. Um, I did, I'll be honest with you, I did that for... I think it's a 90 day challenge yeah. thing that people yeah. do and it completely changes your mindset. It mm. rewires you. It, there's whole scientific yeah. uh, information around this. So I'm not a NoFap expert in anything, but watch the yeah. videos or Google NoFap, watch the videos and do the 90 day challenge yeah. and it will completely rewire your brain and you can channel that energy into so many different areas and it just makes you it's weird, but it does make you productive in every other area when you're doing that NOFA for 90 days. So that's a good way for people to get out of what you're mentioning 100%. Absolutely, 100%. I think it's, it's very important that you said that because you mentioned the 90 days. So, and it's the same with gym, it's the same with anything. Um, to For something to, I think they say, it's for something to become a lifestyle, it must become a habit first. And for it to be a habit for the first 90 days, then it becomes a lifestyle. Then you lose that urge that urge of wanting to masturbate, that urge to wanting to watch porn, you lose that urge once it becomes a lifestyle. First, it's going to be hard. It's that, it's that kind of um, that teething period and, and you yeah. know, you're going to have withdrawal from it as well. But once it's a habit, you just implement the habit, it becomes a lifestyle and the next thing you know, you're a lot more happier, you're a lot more productive, you're glowing internally, externally and it's just a huge path to success. Any successful man that you that you meet has their sexual d- desires in control. Yeah. No, that's that's a really good advice. And in terms of if people want to contact you and uh, try and get into contact with you to learn about uh, physical health, uh, the gym, coaching by Riaz, creative focus for business owners that are watching this, and even people that are potentially aspiring to start their own businesses and they maybe want to contact you, is there a way for them to be able to reach out to you, contact you and 
learn about the videography side of things and also the coaching side of things. They're two really good side hustles that we're putting onto this channel. This channel, we're trying to get as much side hustles mm. as we can for those people because I know how hard it is yeah. when you're looking for real, genuine business opportunities. Mm. You know, you're, you've probably seen it where you're bombarded by Forex guys and, yeah. you know, <laughs> all the flippers and the guys that are just selling you a dream of, uh, you get emails uh, or DMs, send me a thousand, I'll send you two thousand, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and, and so that kind of thing. So this whole channel is just based on people like yourself, role models that are actually going out and doing what they're preaching and you're running businesses, you're doing really well and uh, you're a living example of uh, everything that our core values uh, align to. So, mm-hmm. mashallah, you're doing amazing. What is the way of contacting you? Um, so it's, because I'm going to be kind of quitting my role as an audiologist, I'll be a lot more available in DMs. So I've said it, I'm going to respond to pretty much all of my DMs now. Um, it might take some time, but I'm still going to respond. But um, Instagram, Riazuddin, I know you leave it below as well. TikTok, yeah, Riazuddin, you can re- watch a lot of my content on TikTok. If you want to reach me, you can reach me through DMs. If you want to become a client with coaching, my website is on my bio. If you want to reach out to Creative Focus, you can message the Creative Focus or send me an email on there. I'm active on that as well. And from there, that's that's really how I'm available. And then from then, obviously, when somebody becomes a client, um, they'll have my number. They'll just contact me a lot more frequently, and and you know I'll be there for that 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 support that they need as well. Yeah. What's your mindset and thoughts just quickly on helping people join your industry? So if somebody wants to become a videographer, somebody wants to go down the coaching route, what's your thoughts on helping them? I think um, all of my followers will know that I do not gatekeep any information. I always post um, what I use, my equipment, what I use, what I did to get into coaching, create a focus, everything like that. I'll always share information in abundance because it's still give, 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 give. You know, I mean, why would you gatekeep? And that's what happened when I when I was coming up and trying to, you know, trying to find a lot of things. And people would gatekeep information so much. And I said to myself, when people need, when people ask me for questions, when people ask me for advice, like I'm not going to gatekeep. And those people that asked me now, um, like two years ago, a lot of the brothers, um, they're doing extremely well right now with their followers, with their fitness page and everything like that. And those are the guys that asked me two years ago, Riaz, what do you use? Um, how do I do this? And wallahi now, some of these brothers that I know now, they do it full time, the whole fitness thing, because they took into action what I said. Now imagine if I if I get kept information all the time that, you know, people see you as somebody who they trust and I'm, I'm always for it to, you know, to, to ask, to answer any questions about how I did anything, really, di- you know, dig deep into every single kind of um, structure, the back end, the front end of it, of how I built the businesses, the things that the mistakes I made, the money I spent, um, the equipment that I use and the connections that I made, the people that I got in touch with, how to script um, different kind of uh, messages to, to businesses, how to close clients, how to... Um, message email clients how to story tell how to copyright i'll give all of that information yeah. i'm open to it but i just don't have the time right yeah. now because of how everything is my self-management isn't that great right now yeah. in terms of trying to balance all of that but whenever i can i always share as much information as i can you give a lot of valuable content and uh, people will see that and you align with everything that the the ceo club stands for the values and uh, the mission that we're going out for to try and give those people an opportunity that feel like the door's closing for them and they're just not getting anywhere so thank you so much for coming on i'm going to end it with uh, one recommendation from you if you can any books out there that you'd recommend our viewers to read I know that you've, have you read a few of the Jordan Peterson Jordan, books? Jordan Peterson, um, uh, I, I won't recommend them. <laughs> you won't recommend them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I will, but I think, because um, obviously, I don't know if you want to cut this out, but a lot of the majority of my Muslim followers are Muslims in it and they don't really like Jordan Peterson. They're very kind of... Um, really? Yeah, I, 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 I like him quite a lot. I consume a lot of his content. He's a very open guy, do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? And some people who are very narrow-minded, they'll take what he says, you know, you know to to offense really and yeah. to thingy but i think it, it won't be relevant to recommend books i read now but books i read that that helped me really start up if i was to give one book i would say obviously aside from the quran and any any religious teaching i would say one book that really helped me was think and grow rich by napoleon hill okay that's a really good book it it's amazing and i read it so many times and it just it teaches a lot of 
basic things but when you're on the come up and you're, and you're really you're new to everything and you know you have like that shiny object syndrome you want to kind of go everywhere and do everything that book really helps to lay down the foundations that was the real foundations for me and how to you know then go about things and then I just got into different kind of books and I'd even recommend non-fiction books like Kite Runner uh, and The Mountains Echoed, Khaled Hosseini books I really recommend them because what that did was that gave me an outlet from the whole business aspect of things and to just be creative and, and, and be, you know, in a book and be in that time of where the author's writing about. And it's a bit off topic, off, 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 it's a bit off topic, but it just helps when you're so focused on business, so focused on spirituality and trying mm. to be the best you can. Um, you can add something else into that to kind of give you a nice little detachment in a halal way as well. And it's nice to read a non-fictional book. And I read a lot of non-fiction and it just, it's helped me a lot in my journey. Interesting, really good advice. I think uh, we could probably talk, we've been talking for a while, we could probably yeah. talk for another few hours <laughs> and touch so many different areas and topics and even the agenda that I sent out. There's so many different areas that we could have touched upon and taken uh, the podcast in that direction. But I think uh, for myself, Thank you very much for coming on to the CEO Club and I'm going to be really interested in watching your journey going forward. Best of luck with what happens on Tuesday. Thank you, bro. And uh, inshallah, we'll get you on again at some point inshallah. where we can document your growth. And this, once it goes out, it's out forever. So yeah. people can watch it, view it. Uh, and then when we look back in a few years, inshallah, if we're, if we're here in a few years and we have the opportunity to do this again, bring you back and dive into a few of the topics. You've got valuable knowledge in so many different areas, business, working, your humble brother as well. So thank you very much for coming down. And I'm sure Appreciate there's that, a lot bro. of gems that the viewers have listened and uh, heard that, on this man. podcast. Thank you.